Hello, and welcome to the latest edition of In Focus. I'm your host, Jefferson Denham. While we currently face a global pandemic, it is important now, arguably more than ever, that we engage with the upcoming election on November 3rd. Today, we're sitting down with members of the CSUF community to discuss the importance of voting and the importance of engaging in civil dialogue. Joining us today is Dr. Tara, Assistant Professor of Human Communication Studies, Dr. Scott Spitzer, Associate Professor of Political Science, Brianna Calleros, CSUF Government and Community Relations Specialist, and Lauren Loeb, ASI Chief Governmental Officer. So hello everybody and thank you so much for being with us today. So uh, what I want to do for our audience is have you, uh, we'll just go around and introduce ourselves and if you could just tell us your relationship to Cal State Fullerton and then any of areas of expertise that will be relevant to the topics that we're going to talk about today. So Dr. Tara, I'm going to start with you. Let's go in the order in which I introduced you. Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Tara Suminyati Chaiporn, and I do go by Dr. Tara. I am an assistant professor of human communication studies, and I'm also the organizer of the civil dialogue events that Cal State Fullerton hosts every year. That's wonderful. All right, Dr. Spitzer, please introduce yourself. Well, I am so happy to be part of this. My name is Scott Spitzer. I'm a professor of political science. I have been for a long time involved in uh, creating opportunities for students to get civically engaged on campus through my courses and outside of my classes. Of course, this year with this election being so important, um, more important than most elections, um, I've really been putting a push for everybody to get connected to voting and other ways of having their voice heard. So really pleased to be part of this program as well. Wonderful. Brianna? Sure, I'm Brianna Calleros, a specialist in the Office of Government and Community Relations. I am originally from Orange County, and my sister is actually a Cal State Fullerton alumna. I have a Master's of Public Policy and have worked in both government and nonprofit nonprofit policy and advocacy. And in one of my prior roles, I was a staffer in the California State Legislature managing a bill portfolio related to voting rights. Wonderful. So great to have you. And then Lauren. Hey, everyone. My name is Lauren Loeb. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the Chief Governmental Officer for ASI. One of my main tasks is encouraging and giving students and other members of our campus community uh, the tools they need to be able to go out and vote. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you so much for being with us, and thank you, Titan TV audience, for, for being with us, too. So let's start off with this, and Lauren, I'm going to start with you. Why is it important to vote? I know this sounds like a very basic question, but why is it important to vote, especially if you're a student, during a pandemic? So a lot of things are going to be determined by this election. It's important that students are using their voice and letting um, our elected officials know what we care about and the issues that are concerning to us, especially in our local elections where a lot of people aren't too sure uh, what is being handled and what is being impacted. Um, but it's still really important, just as important as the presidential election. I'm glad you phrased it that way because it does seem like there's more things um, on the ballot than just the president. Um, local elections, there's all the propositions. So I want to open it up to anybody else that would like to answer that question as well. Uh, why is it important to vote and especially with the challenges of a pandemic upon us? You know, uh, uh, being part of a democracy, democracy is not a spectator sport. Unfortunately, uh, one of the biggest problems we have in the United States, in my view, is a really low level of voting turnout, particularly when we're not talking about presidential elections. Over recent years, we've seen some really nice improvements. Like in 2018, we had historic levels of voting turnout in that midterm election. That's an election between a presidential elections, the middle of a presidential term. Uh, when we uh, vote for every single member of our House of Representatives, a third of our U.S. Senators, and s countless numbers of uh, local officials. This year is even more important, and it's more important because the issues are so, so important. They affect every single one of us. Uh, the course of uh, the government response to the pandemic at the national, state, and local levels uh, affects each one of our lives, the state of the economy, um, not to mention um, longstanding and increasingly obvious issues about race relations and policing, 
and uh, climate change, really the issues are huge and enormous. And it's all the more important that every American who has an opportunity to vote gets out and has their vote, their voice heard. Well, absolutely true. I think everybody on this panel and hopefully everybody watching would, would think the same thing. Uh, Brianna. I would just like to reiterate that it is always important to vote and that the current pandemic is not a reason to sit this election out. There mm -hmm. are a variety of options available to voters to do so in a safe manner. You know, I'm glad you said what you just said. I'm sure you've all seen on the news, there has been um, early voting with early voting beginning. There have been long lines, we've seen this, uh, where people are hopefully all wearing masks and social distancing. But I mean, there are challenges to voting during a pandemic. What can we do, what can students do if they choose to vote in person? What are some things just to make sure that they're doing? Sure, so I think students and just any voter in general should know all of their options. So voting in person is one of those options, but also vote by mail is available where you can return uh, the ballot in the mail without a postage stamp, or you can also drop off your ballot at a drop off location um, or at a vote center or your polling location. Uh, during early voting days. So these are all options that are available. For those who are going in person, uh, I would just encourage them to go early. Vote centers are open for early voting in Orange County that starts on October 30th. And so you don't have to wait until November 3rd to cast your ballot. If you plan to do it by mail, do so early. You can do it now do it sooner rather than later. And if you plan to go to the polls, I would encourage voters to go early before November 3rd, if possible. That sounds like fantastic advice. Dr. Tara, I have a question for you because I believe that we've all been experiencing, I think I'm not sh sharing anything that's completely a surprise to anybody. We've all been experiencing a lot of misinformation, especially about, let's say, voting by mail. Um, so what, what do you think about that and how can we sift through some of that. Uh, let's say we've heard things and we thought, okay, and I, you've probably seen too, there was a story a day or so ago that there were fake uh, ballot box drop-off sites. Um, how, what advice would you have for people to make, sh either to make us feel better about mailing in our votes or just to be aware of what's out there that maybe isn't for our benefit? I think that our civil dialogue event last week um, our panelists were being very informative about how the mail-in uh, fraud or the mistakes are very in very low percentage. So that shouldn't deter any students or people in voting by mail. Um, I recommend that, you know, one of the easiest ways and it's actually including exercising is completing your ballot and walking it to um, one of those drop-off boxes that are around. I did recent research and there's many, many boxes around every city. You just have to make sure sure that it is a registered box on the official website that is not one of the fake boxes that are <laughs> potentially out there. Wonderful. So it's really on us and our, to be responsible and that's what this is about and that's what your conversation opportunities have been about. And can I just give a shout out to Cal State Fullerton. There are wonderful, uh, all kinds of wonderful things, uh, resources available, ways to have dialogue uh, and inform yourself. In fact, I believe Brianna and Lauren, you've put together, what is it, the, the Titans Turnout website. Lauren, could you describe that a little bit for us? Yeah, definitely. So um, with the work of the Gov Relations Office and ASI, um, we've come up with this website that covers um, five important topics regarding um, the election, how to register, why is my vote important, understanding the issues, how to vote, and understanding election outcome. Um, people can find information about the election on the website. You can even find if you're in the Orange County area um, where your ballot drop off boxes will be or if you're trying to vote early, um, you can also find information about that. Um, we do recommend that people turn in their ballots early if they are uh, mailing them in. Um, and you can also track where your ballot's going from the Secretary of State's website. Um, so we have all of these new um, online resources that people can really take advantage of to make sure that they're voting safely and that their vote is being counted. So once you get to the website, it's going to be fullerton.edu slash election slash, and then it's going to take you there. Um, anything you're interested in knowing, you can click on one of the five tabs at the top um, and it'll share the information with you there. Got it. 
And then Brianna, so we've heard a lot about, or at least I have, about creating a voting plan, you know, so that you're not just haphazardly showing up, but having an actual uh, strategy for preparing and then voting. What advice would you give our viewers to develop their own voting plan? Sure, so I would say the first thing that someone who wants to vote should do is check their voter registration. Make sure you're registered and make sure your registration is up to date. And so there is a link on our website. If you click on how to register, it links directly to the Secretary of State's website where you can check your voter registration in the state of California. Uh, another thing is just to make sure to vote early. Know that those options are available to vote early so that you are not waiting in line um, on election day, that you're not putting yourself and others at risk unnecessarily. Uh, and then just in general, knowing your options include uh, vote by mail, um, remembering if you do vote by mail to sign your ballot envelope before you put it in the mailbox, that you can drop it off uh, and you can also vote in person. Those are three options that are available to voters. And so I would just recommend uh, that voters be aware of all of these options and choose the one that works best for them in terms of their schedule and their comfort level. I think that's very awesome advice. Uh, Dr. Spitzer. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, first of all, this idea of making a plan is really important this year. And we have so much, we're really lucky we live in California because we have so many options as uh, Brianna and uh, Lauren were pointing out. You know, if you have a pre-existing health condition um, or for whatever reason you're concerned about um, exposing yourself to potential COVID, um, you don't want to vote in person, uh, voting by mail is a great, great option. I want to just allay people's concerns about the Postal Service, one of the great things about California is the uh, Secretary of State has already issued, uh, you know, there's already a law in California for this election that our ballots will be counted as long as they're postmarked before election day or on the election day by November 3rd. Um, and you really need to be careful about that. If you're mailing in your ballot on November 3rd, um, make sure that it's going into a mailbox that the mail hasn't left yet. And better yet, if you're going to go on the third, um, go into your post office and make sure it's stamped, um, you know, go up to the desk and make sure it's stamped. But if you're trying to avoid all of that, mail it at least a week in advance. That's by October the 28th. Um, and as long as it's postmarked, uh, California will count those votes for 17 days after the election. Okay, so even if you're concerned about oh, the Postal Service is slow. By the way, the Postal Service has been forced to back off of any changes and diminishing its services through a number of court cases and um, a lot of public pressure. So um, you can be pretty sure that if you decide to vote by mail, that your vote will be counted. But there are so many great options and uh, just make a plan um, that fits your life and, and stick with it. That's, that's part of our responsibility too, to not only do our homework and be intentional. Uh, Dr. Tara, I have a question about all the ballot initiatives. If you've got any strategy when you, because you know, when, as, as a voter, every election cycle, we always feel like we're inundated with all kinds of ads and even texts um, you know, about this issue and that issue. And I always tell my family, don't, if, don't pay attention to the ads. You cannot vote via ads. How do you navigate through all the ballot, ballot initiatives, what kind of advice can you give our viewers to really kind of make sense of it? Yes, thank you for the question. So um, recently I've seen what is popular is people actually get together and uh, complete their ballot together. Um, I would recommend against that actually because um, there's a such thing called group thing fallacy where you know you're all your friends or family members are voting uh, yes or no for a certain prop and you felt like you have to vote the same as them because you're all in the same room and completing your ballot together as an exercise. Um, so I think number one is to do it alone, maybe with your spouse or partner, um, but that's it. I don't think that voting all together in a group is a great idea in terms of diversity of thought. So first is to complete your, the ballot uh, on your own or with your spouse. Second, I would recommend that you uh, Google and do your research on every prop that's on your ballot. 
um, make sure that you read up more than one summary because that could be a bias summary. Um, make sure that you at least read up a couple of summaries on the ballot, uh, on the propositions in terms of voting yes or no. There's also a lot of informative YouTube videos um, out there on each proposition. So I think it is our own responsibility in seeking out informative and non-biased information to complete our ballot. Yes, making sure we're not succumbing to groupthink and also confirmation bias. So to challenge our thoughts, thank you for that. Brianna. Well, I will share that Dr. Sarah Hill does an event uh, every election and she goes through each of the ballot propositions and explains them in a very relatable way. It will be available online, it was recorded. And so I encourage anyone with questions about the ballot propositions to visit the elections website on the events tab. We will share recordings of any events, but including Dr. Hill's Ballot Proposition 101 event. And personally, I will just share uh, that it, it makes sense to look at who is supporting uh, a certain proposition. Um, so for example, the Democratic Party and Republican parties will take positions uh, and also a, a nonpartisan, unbiased group to look at could be the League of Women Voters who also take positions. Um, so those are, are things I would encourage people to look up as they make their informed decision about the ballot propositions. Can I just add something real quick? Uh, the League of Women Voters in particular, I think, uh, first of all, Dr. Hill's awesome. She's my colleague and I would definitely recommend watching that. And then if you go to the League of Women Voters website, there is a very fancy app there, uh, which you can use to, to go through every single position and every single proposition, you just put in your address and it will give you basically your ballot and you can fill it out right there. And you can click on things to give you pro and con and find out who's for and who's against every single proposition, um, who's endorsed it, all that stuff is right there for you. It's completely nonpartisan. So don't be worried that the League of Women Voters is trying to influence you one way or another. It, you will be able to make up your own mind. And by the time you're done with it, you can just have your printout. You'll be you you'll have made your decisions, and then you can use that to to vote. Well, Lauren, you had something to add, I believe. Yeah. So ASI has also collaborated with Dr. Sarah Hill on October 19th. Uh, we will be working with her to record information about uh, propositions that. Uh, will most likely affect students in different ways than other communities, um, but she will be sharing that information in very relatable terms, like Brianna said, um, to give students that information without um, confusing them like um, some of those ads or some of the other information out there can do. Well said. Well, let's segue now into uh, civil discourse, something that it almost seems like has gone the way of the VCR, <laughs> but <laughs> So what I want to get to is, um, Dr. Tara, I know you just had a recent event and, um, and it was entitled, The American Voting System Cannot Be Trusted. You were quoted in the Orange County Register as saying, I've always told my students that you're not going to change anyone's mind by screaming. Really? Uh, instead, <laughs> step back and take a deep breath. All right, Dr. Tara. Let's start with you, and I know, Dr. Spitzer, you were a part of this last thing as well. It, it, it is sorely needed, and can you just give us a, your estimation of why we are at this kind of crossroads, why everything is as divided as it is? The actual division has various historical reasons in which I may not be able to get into right now. However, I do think that this particular election does create a lot of uh, passionate followers in, in both parties. Um, a lot of people are not well versed in um, civil communication with others or engaging in a diversity, um, dial a diverse dialogue with others. So instead of engaging in um, civil communication, they decided to passionately communicate their cause in which uh, it's not technically a bad thing. I think that uh, 
thought diversity is a good sign of a pluralistic democratic society in which that we are. Um, however, I do, my job is to encourage civil dialogue, which is celebrating and, and fostering the diversity of thought and that uh, I give spaces to people, uh, responses from strongly agree to strongly disagree to the issue. And for that particular statement, that was our last event on voting integrity. And we were able to hear uh, from people of different perspectives. And I think that's just real life, even though this event was structured. If you think about it, your family and friends, if you do have a diverse network, you probably have people that agree and disagree with either side of this election. So uh, in engaging in civil dialogue, I think it requires work um, from everybody, but it is for the better future. I call this particular um, dialogue style a civility first framework so instead of selling your cause to others or trying to um, yell or scream about why you believe in a certain thing i think that we need to focus on the civility first framework um, should i go into the four a's briefly i wish you would all right so the four a's i think are first ask questions um, asking questions is really important and it is downplayed a lot nowadays when people are trying to assert their opinion. First, ask questions from the other person, the other party. Why do they believe in certain things? Second is active listening. Um, at, by actively listening to the other person, you realize that they probably have a good reason for themselves why they believe in a certain thing. Uh, third is to accept that there will always be differences. Um, and that difference is actually a good thing. How boring would it be if everyone's just A, right? Um, and lastly is to assert facts. Um, when you are discussing uh, a controversial issue with a passionate person, it is helpful for the other person to assert fact, uh, factual information instead of also their passionate opinion, in my opinion. I appreciate that, and I appreciate your efforts. I know that your first event, I think, was in 2017, and you've been bringing it to Cal State Fullerton ever since then. But Dr. Spitzer, let's, let's tag on to what Dr. Tara just said, uh, stating facts. Well, what if the facts are not agreed upon? Well, I mean, I think that's really important. Of course, people are gonna disagree about how to interpret policy items how to interpret the strengths and weaknesses of various candidacies. But I think what Dr. Tara is saying, and I know this from participating in her events, two of them now, um, which is that our arguments need to be focused on substantive issues, right? Rather than personalizing things. I mean, you can personalize it saying that this is important to me because I'm a father or I'm a taxpayer or whatever. But ultimately the arguments that we need to engage in with each other are about, um, you know, how we see the facts and we can disagree. We can say, you know, uh, the economy is, uh, was really good under President Trump and then it failed. Or we might say the economy uh, was only good because of President Obama and then uh, President Trump ruined it, right? Those are legitimate disagreements about how to interpret the state of the economy and what the role of the coronavirus has been in terms of where we're at right now um, and what the role, relative role of the president has been. But it's still useful to be able to discuss this in the ways we see the facts, right? And so we get it all out there on the table, which is why it's important to have uh, discussions with people who disagree with us. And as Dr. Tara said, you know, asking and you know, engaging in uh, active listening that, that takes a little work, especially when we are so hell-bent on proving how right we are. Um, Lauren, I have a question for you in, in that I know, I believe you worked on uh, a campaign here at uh, Fullerton to engage in um, the census. Am I correct about that? Yeah, so um, a lot of our census work was done by um, past CGOs um, since the census started in 2019. Um, but continuing that work and trying to get people to uh, fill out the census was really important to us because of how many things are affected by um, what we 
put in those um, reports and what we're able to allocate to our communities. Now that you've seen like, uh, and I don't want to get into the weeds too much about this, but when you see issues as uh, Dr. Spitzer was, you know, uh, telling us about, there are issues that we can honestly disagree about. And so the Supreme Court stopped the count of the census, as you know. And so when you personally, when you engage with family or anybody that you disagree with, do you seek out people to talk to with uh, a different point of view than yours? Um, definitely, I definitely think it's important to understand um, both sides of an argument um, to, I think, better understand why you believe in something um, and understand why something might not be going the way that we expect it or the way that we want. Um, I think that sometimes we can look at issues and say to ourselves, I don't understand why this isn't being followed through with. Well, it's because you're not seeing it from the perspective of the other side of the aisle. Um, and I think that's really important to be able to strengthen your own argument, your own beliefs, um, and also come together and collaborate on issues that uh, we may not always see eye to eye on. Well said. Brianna, I know that in your position, you connect not only the governments and nonprofits, but to Cal State Fullerton. Do you have a strategy when you do that? Because you're going to come across disparate, different perspectives and personalities. Do you have a personal uh, strategy in getting people to come together and understand each other even with differences? Sure. Well, we represent uh, the university to the broader community. And so we are always mindful in how we do our outreach and who we outreach to, which is all the members of our delegation, whether it, the political party doesn't matter. We work on creating positive relationships um, with everyone in our community. Wonderful. So, um, Dr. Tara, I just want to start this lab. We're going to start to wrap things up a little bit, but I do want to ask you, are there any other areas of voting and or civil discourse that maybe you would like to address that we haven't specifically asked you yet? Oh, yes. I'd like to um, announce my upcoming talk that is hosted by the Alumni Engagement Office. It's a part of the Go Vote Voter Education Series, and it is titled Civility First. It's going to be on October 23rd. And that in that talk, I will be highlighting various strategies in engaging in a civil dialogue with other people um, of both aisles. I also want to encourage people to engage in the civility for strategies that I just talked about, the four A's, um, which is active listening, uh, accepting the differences, asking questions, and asserting facts with everybody, uh, people in their lives, online. It's all about modeling this type of behavior, um, not only to the younger generation, but our generation, the older generation, um, for it to catch on. Wonderful. So don't miss that, people. Uh, Dr. Spitzer, any closing thoughts about either civil discourse or um, voting? Just, uh, first of all, what a, a great panel. Thank you so much for having me be a part of this. One thing I just wanna encourage people to think about, uh, if, you're, if you're, because we live in California, there are a lot of people who say, well, um, this is a blue state, so it always goes for the Democrat for presidential elections. Well, I just want to remind people, I know you know this, but just think about it again, that there are a lot of other elections that are happening all at the same time for House of Representatives. Those races are incredibly close. And our local elections, who, who are, who's going to be making decisions about the budget for your local police department? That's your city council and your mayor. We're voting on those offices as well. And there we have had a really low turnout problem over the years. So you can really make a big difference by engaging in this election um, and finding out who's running. But get yourself informed, learn about the people who are running, not just uh, President Trump versus Vice President Biden, but all the other races. And you can really be an important part of this process. Wow. That's a fantastic reminder. Brianna, do you have any closing thoughts for us? I think we talk a lot about the right to vote in this country. Uh, for those of us who were born here, like myself, I think it could be very easy to take this right for granted. 
uh, because we've never really had to do anything <laughs> to receive that right. It was just given to us by virtue of where we were born. Um, but I do also want to recognize that the so-called right to vote is not extended to everybody in our country. Um, so if there are legal permanent residents, folks who are undocumented, um, and, and these are people who I think there is a role for them in our democracy, even if it is not at the polls. And I would just like to recognize that experience as well as to share ways that um, they may also get involved. And that can include talking to your friends and family who are eligible to vote and saying, you know, what what is important to you? What are the issues that impact you, that you care about? Um, I think it's important for those of us who do have the right to vote to also realize what a true privilege it is and to exercise that right. And keep in mind um, how our vote can often impact others. That's a fantastic reminder, Brianna, because yeah, it is a privilege. And um, Lauren, I was just reading, uh, maybe you saw it too, there was a recent poll that they're guesstimating that 70% of college students now are interested, at least interested in voting. But how would you encourage us, any closing thoughts on, how would you encourage us to cross over that line from interest to actually action? So something that we've been trying to reiterate to students is that your vote does not only impact you, but it impacts the people around you, our campus community, friends, and neighbors. Um, so really thinking critically about what we're voting for in this upcoming election. Um, something that the state of California has been doing to try and get students more involved um, civically and in the uh, voter process is the ballot bowl put on by the California Secretary of State's office. Um, Cal State Fullerton is currently in first place, so we're really excited, but we want more students to register to vote and make it to the polls on election day or vote um, through the mail or any other way that they're able to. Not that we're competitive, but hey, we're number one. I just want to point that out. <laughs> well, that is all the time we have for today. I want to, and as Dr. Spitzer said, this has been such a wonderful panel, had such a great time. Wish we could spend more time together. I want to thank our guests, Dr. Tara, Dr. Scott Spitzer, Brianna Cayeros, and Lauren Loeb once again for joining us today. And you can find links to read more about the important information that we discussed in the description box below. Until next time, I'm your host, Jefferson Denham with In Focus. So stay safe, Titans, wash your hands, wear masks, oh, and get out the vote. Make your mother proud. We'll see you next time. <laughs>